girls. Rose sat all alone in the big best parlour, with her little handkerchief laid ready to catch the first tear, for she was thinking of her troubles, and a shower was expected. She had retired to this room as a good place in which to be miserable, for it was dark and still, full of ancient furniture, sombre curtains, and hung all round with portraits of solemn old gentlemen in wigs, severe nosed ladies in top heavy caps, and staring children in little bob tailed coats or short waisted frocks. It was an excellent place for woe, and the fitful spring rain that pattered on the window pane seemed to sob, Cry away, I'm with you. Rose really did have some cause to be sad, for she had no mother, and had lately lost her father also, which left her no home but this with her great aunts. She had been with them only a week, and, though the dear old ladies had tried their best to make her happy, they had not succeeded very well, for she was unlike any child they had ever seen, and they felt very much as if they had the care of a low-spirited butterfly. They had given her the freedom of the house, and, for a day or two, she had amused herself roaming all over it, for it was a capital old mansion, and was full of all manner of odd nooks, charming rooms, and mysterious passages. Windows broke out in unexpected places, little balconies overhung the garden most romantically, and there was a long upper hall full of curiosities from all parts of the world, for the Campbells had been sea captains for generations. Aunt Plenty had even allowed Rose to rummage in her great china closet, a spicy retreat, rich in all the goodies that children love. But Rose seemed to care little for these toothsome temptations, and when that hope failed, Aunt Plenty gave up in despair. Gentle Aunt Peace had tried all sorts of pretty needlework, and planned a doll's wardrobe that would have won the heart of even an older child. But Rose took little interest in pink satin hats and tiny hose, though she so dutifully till her aunt caught her wiping tears away with the train of a wedding dress, and that discovery put an end to the sewing society. Then both old ladies put their heads together, and picked out the model child of the neighbourhood to come and play with their niece. But Amabel Bliss was the worst failure of all, for Rose could not bear the sight of her, and said she was so like a wax doll she longed to give her a pinch and see if she would squeak. So prim little Amabel was sent home, and the exhausted aunties left Rose to her own devices for a day or two. Bad weather and a cold kept her indoors, and she spent most of her time in the library, where her father's books were stored. Here she read a great deal, cried a little, and dreamed many of the innocent, bright dreams in which imaginative children find such comfort and delight. This suited her better than anything else, but it was not good for her, and she grew pale, heavy-eyed and listless though Aunt Plenty gave her iron enough to make a cooking stove, and Aunt Peace petted her like a poodle. Seeing this, the poor aunties racked their brains for a new amusement, and determined to venture a bold stroke, though not very hopeful of its success. They said nothing to Rose about their plan for the Saturday afternoon, but let her alone till the time came for the grand surprise, little dreaming that the odd child would find pleasure for herself in a most unexpected quarter. Before she had time to squeeze out a single tear, a sound broke the stillness, making her prick up her ears. It was only the soft twitter of a bird, but it seemed to be a peculiarly gifted bird, for while she listened, the soft twitter changed to a lively whistle, then a trill, a coo, a chirp, and ended in a musical mixture of all the notes, as if the bird burst out laughing. Rose laughed also, and, forgetting her woes, jumped up, saying eagerly, it's a mockingbird. Where is it? Running down the long hall, she peeped out at both doors, but saw nothing feathered except a draggle-tailed chicken under a burdock leaf. She listened again, and the sound seemed to be in the house. Away she went, much excited by the chase, and following the changeful song, it led her to the china closet door. In there? How funny, she said. But when she entered, not a bird appeared except the everlastingly kissing swallows on the canton china that lined the shelves. All of a sudden, Rose's face brightened, and, softly opening the slide, she peered into the kitchen. But the music had stopped, and all she saw was a girl in a blue apron scrubbing the hearth. Rose stared about her for a minute, and then asked abruptly, "'Did you hear that mockingbird?' "'I should call it a Phoebe bird,' answered the girl, looking up with a twinkle in her black eyes. 
Where did it go? Is here still? Where? In my throat? Do you want to hear it? Oh, yes. I'll come in. And Rose crept through the slide to the wide shelf on the other side, being too hurried and puzzled to go round by the door. The girl wiped her hands, crossed her feet on the little island of carpet where she was stranded in a sea of soap suds, and then, sure enough, out of her slender throat came the swallow's twitter, the robin's whistle, the blue jay's call, the thrush's song, the wood dove's coo, and many another familiar note, all ending as before with the musical ecstasy of a bobolink singing and swinging amongst the meadow grass on a bright June day. Rose was so astonished that she nearly fell off her perch, and, when the little concert was over, clapped her hands delightedly. Oh, it was lovely! Who taught you? The birds, answered the girl, with a smile, as she fell to work again. It is very wonderful. I can sing, but nothing half so fine as that. What's your name, please? Phoebe Moore. I've heard of Phoebe birds, but I don't believe the real ones could do that, laughed Rose adding, as she watched with interest, the scattering of dabs of soft soap over the bricks. "'May I stay and see you work? It's very lonely in the parlour. "'Yes, indeed, if you want to,' answered Phoebe, wringing out her cloth in a capable sort of way that impressed Rose very much. "'It must be fun to have swashed the water round and dig out the soap. I'd love to do it, only Aunt wouldn't like it, I suppose,' said Rose, quite taken with the new employment. You'd soon get tired, so you'd better keep tidy and look on. I suppose you help your mother a good deal. I haven't got any folks. Why, where do you live, then? I'm going to live here, I hope. Debbie wants someone to help Brand, and I've come to try for a week. I hope you will stay, for it is very dull, said Rose, who had taken a sudden fancy to this girl, who sung like a bird and worked like a woman. I hope I shall for I'm fifteen now, and old enough to earn my own living. You've come to stay a spell, haven't you? asked Phoebe, looking up at her guest, and wondering how life could be dull to a girl who wore a silk frock, a daintily frilled apron, a pretty locket, and had her hair tied up with a velvet snood. Yes, I shall stay till my uncle comes. He is my guardian now, and I don't know what he will do with me. Have you a guardian? My sakes, no! I was left on the poorhouse steps a little mite of a baby. Mrs. Rogers took a liking to me, so I've been there ever since. But she is dead now, and I take care of myself. How interesting! It is like Arabella Montgomery in The Gypsy Child. Did you ever read that sweet story? asked Rose, who was fond of tales of foundlings and had read many. I don't have any books to read, and all the spare time I get I run off into the woods. That rests me better than stories, answered Phoebe as she finished one job and began on another. Rose watched her as she got out a great pan of beans to look over, and wondered how it would seem to have life all work and no play. Presently, Phoebe seemed to think it was her turn to ask questions, and said, wistfully, "'You've had lots of schooling, I suppose?' "'Oh, dear me, yes. I've been at boarding school nearly a year, and I'm almost dead with lessons. The more I got, the more Miss Power gave me, and I was so miserable I most cried my eyes out.' Papa never gave me hard things to do, and he always taught me so pleasantly I loved to study. Oh, we were so happy and so fond of one another. But now he is gone, and I am left all alone. The tear that would not come when Rose sat waiting for it came now of its own accord, two of them, in fact, and rolled down her cheeks, telling the tale of love and sorrow better than any words could do it. For a minute there was no sound in the kitchen, the little daughter's sobbing, and the sympathetic patter of the rain. Phoebe stopped rattling her beans from one pan to the other, and her eyes were full of pity as they rested on the curly head bent down on Rose's knee, for she saw that the heart under the pretty locket ached with its loss, and the dainty apron was used to dry sadder tears than any she had ever shed. Somehow she felt more contented with her brown calico gown and blue check pinafore. Envy changed to compassion, and if she had dared she would have gone and hugged her afflicted guest. Fearing that might not be considered proper, she said, in her cheery voice, I'm sure you ain't all alone with such a lot of folks belonging to you, and all so rich and clever. 
You'll be petted to pieces, Debbie says, because you are the only girl in the family. Phoebe's last words made Rose smile in spite of her tears, and she looked up from behind her apron with an April face, saying in a tone of comic distress, That's one of my troubles. I've got six aunts, and they all want me, and I don't know any of them very well. Papa named this place the Ant Hill, and now I see why. Phoebe laughed with her as she said encouragingly, "'Everyone calls it so. "'It's a real good name for all the Mrs. Campbells live handy by "'and keep coming up to see the old ladies. "'I could stand the aunts, but there are dozens of cousins, "'dreadful boys, all of them, and I detest boys. "'Some of them came to see me last Wednesday, "'but I was lying down, and when Auntie came to call me, "'I went under the quilt and pretended to be asleep. "'I shall have to see them some time, but I do dread it so.' "'And Rose gave a shudder, for... Having lived alone with her invalid father, she knew nothing of boys and considered them a species of wild animal. "'Oh, I guess you'll like em. I've seen em flying round when they come over from the point, sometimes in their boats and sometimes on horseback. If you like boats and horses, you'll enjoy yourself first rate.' "'But I don't. I'm afraid of horses, and boats make me ill, and I hate boys.' And poor Rose wrung her hands at the awful prospect before her. One of these horrors alone she could have borne, but altogether were too much for her, and she began to think of a speedy return to the detested school. Phoebe laughed at her woe till the beans danced in the pan, but tried to comfort her by suggesting a means of relief. Perhaps your uncle will take you away where there ain't any boys. Debbie says he's a real kind man, and always brings heaps of nice things when he comes. Yes, but you see that is another trouble, for I don't know Uncle Alec at all. He hardly ever came to see us, though he sent me pretty things very often. Now I belong to him, and shall have to mind him till I'm eighteen. I may not like him a bit, and I fret about it all the time. Well, I wouldn't borrow trouble, but have a real good time. I'm sure I should think I was in clover if I had folks and money, and nothing to do but enjoy myself, began Phoebe but got no further, for a sudden rush and rumble outside made them both jump. "'It's thunder,' said Phoebe. "'It's a circus!' cried Rose, who, from her elevated perch, had caught glimpses of a gay cart of some sort, and several ponies with flying manes and tails. The sound died away, and the girls were about to continue their confidences, when old Debbie appeared, looking rather cross and sleepy after her nap. "'You're wanted in the parlour, Miss Rose.' "'Has anybody come?' "'Little girls shouldn't ask questions, but do as they're bid,' was all Debbie would answer. "'I do hope it isn't Aunt Myra. "'She always scares me out of my wits, asking how my cough is, "'and groaning over me as if I was going to die,' said Rose, "'preparing to retire the way she came. "'For the slide, being cut for the admission of bouncing Christmas turkeys and puddings, "'was plenty large enough for a slender girl.' "'Guess you'll wish it was, Aunt Myra, when you see who has come. "'Don't never let me catch you coming into my kitchen that way again, "'or I'll shut you up in the big parlour,' growled Debbie, "'who thought it her duty to snub children on all occasions. "'End of chapter one. "'The Clan "'Rose scrambled into the china closet as rapidly as possible, "'and there refreshed herself by making faces at Debbie.' while she settled her plumage and screwed up her courage. Then she crept softly down the hall and peeped into the parlour. No one appeared, and all was so still she felt sure the company was upstairs. So she skipped boldly through the half-open folding doors, to behold on the other side a sight that nearly took her breath away. Seven boys stood in a row, all ages, all sizes, all yellow-haired and blue-eyed, all in full Scotch costume, and all smiling, nodding, and saying, as with one voice, "'How are you, cousin?' Rose gave a little gasp and looked wildly about her, as if ready to fly, for fear magnified the seven, and the room seemed full of boys. Before she could run, however, the tallest lad stepped out of the line, saying pleasantly, "'Don't be frightened. This is the clan come to welcome you, and I'm the chief, Archie, at your service.' He held out his hand as he spoke, and Rose timidly put her own into a brown paw, which closed over it as the chief continued his introductions. "'We came in full rig, for we always turn out in style on grand occasions. Hope you like it.' 
Now I'll tell you who these chaps are, and then we shall be all right. This big one's Prince Charlie, Aunt Clara's boy. She has but one, so he's an extra good one. This old fellow's Mac, the bookworm, called worm for short. This sweet creature is Steve the Dandy. Look at his gloves and topknot, if you please. They're Aunt Jane's lads, and a precious pair you'd better believe. These are the brats, my brothers, Geordie and Will, and Jamie the baby. Now, my men, step out and show your manners. At this command, to Rose's great dismay, six more hands were offered, and it was evident that she was expected to shake them all. It was a trying moment to the bashful child, but, remembering that they were her kinsmen, come to welcome her, she tried her best to return the greeting cordially. This impressive ceremony being over, the clan broke ranks, and both rooms instantly appeared to be pervaded with boys. Rose hastily retired to the shelter of a big chair, and sat there, watching the invaders and wondering when her aunt would come and rescue her. As if bound to do their duty manfully, yet rather oppressed by it, each lad paused beside her chair in his wanderings, made a brief remark, received a still briefer answer, then sheared off with a relieved expression. Archie came first, and, leaning over the chair back, observed in a paternal tone, "'I'm glad you've come, cousin, and I hope you'll find the anthill pretty jolly.' "'I think I shall.' Mac shook his hair out of his eyes, stumbled over a stool, and asked abruptly, "'Did you bring any books with you?' Four boxes full. They are in the library.' Mac vanished from the room, and Steve, striking an attitude which displayed his costume effectively, said with an affable smile, "'We were sorry not to see you last Wednesday. I hope your cold is better.' "'Yes, thank you.' And a smile began to dimple about Rose's mouth as she remembered her retreat under the bed cover. Feeling that he had been received with distinguished marks of attention, Steve strolled away with his top knot higher than ever, and Prince Charlie pranced across the room, saying in a free and easy tone, "'Mama sent her love and hopes you will be well enough to come over for a day next week. Must be desperately dull here for a little thing like you.' "'I'm thirteen and a half, though I do look small.' cried Rose, forgetting her shyness in indignation at this insult to her newly acquired teens. "'Beg pardon, ma'am. Never should have guessed it.' And Charlie went off with a laugh, glad to have struck a spark out of his meek cousin. Geordie and Will came together, two sturdy eleven- and twelve-year-olders, and, fixing their round blue eyes on Rose, fired off a question apiece as if it was a shooting match and she the target. "'Did you bring your monkey?' "'No.' He is dead. Are you going to have a boat? I hope not. Here the two, with a right-about face movement, abruptly marched away, and little Jamie demanded with childish frankness, Did you bring me anything nice? Yes, lots of candy, answered Rose, whereupon Jamie ascended into her lap with a sounding kiss and the announcement that he liked her very much. This proceeding rather startled Rose, for the other lads looked and laughed and in her confusion she said hastily to the young usurper, did, "'Did you see the circus go by?' "'When? Where?' cried all the boys in great excitement at once. "'Just before you came. At least I thought it was a circus, for I saw a red and black sort of cart, and ever so many little ponies, and—' She got no farther, for a general shout made her pause suddenly, as Archie explained the joke by saying in the middle of his laugh, "'It was our new dog-cart, and the Shetland ponies!' You'll never hear the last of your circus, cousin. But but there were so many, and they went so fast, and the cart was so very red, began Rose, trying to explain her mistake. Come and see them all, cried the prince, and before she knew what was happening, she was borne away to the barn and tumultuously introduced to three shaggy ponies and the gay new dog cart. She had never visited these regions before, and had her doubts as to the propriety of her being there now, but when she suggested that Auntie might not like it. There was a general cry of, She told us to amuse you, and we can do it ever so much better out here than poking round in the house. I'm afraid I shall get cold without my sack, began Rose, who wanted to stay, but felt rather out of her element. No, you won't. We'll fix you, cried the lads, as one clapped his cap on her head, another tied a rough jacket round her neck by the sleeves, and a third nearly smothered her in a carriage blanket and the fourth threw open the door of the old barouche that stood there, saying with a flourish, "'Step in, ma'am, and make yourself comfortable while we show you some fun.' 
So Rose sat, in state, enjoying herself very much, for the lads proceeded to dance a highland fling with a spirit and skill that made her clap her hands and laugh as she had not done for weeks. "'How's that, my lassie?' asked the prince, coming up all flushed and breathless when the ballet was over. "'It was splendid. I never went to the theatre but once, and the dancing was not half so pretty as this. "'What clever boys you must be!' said Rose." smiling upon her kinsman like a little queen upon her subjects. "'Ah, we're a fine lot, and that is only the beginning of our larks. We haven't got the pipes here, we'd—' "'Sing for you, play for you, a dulcy melody,' answered Charlie, looking much elated at her praise. "'I did not know we were Scotch. Papa never said anything about it, or seemed to care about Scotland, except to have me sing the old ballads,' said Rose, beginning to feel as if she had left America behind her somewhere. Neither did we till lately. We've been reading Scott's novels, and all of a sudden we remembered that our grandfather was a Scotchman. So we hunted up the old stories, got a bagpipe, put on our plaids, and went in heart and soul for the glory of the clan. We've been at it some time now, and it's great fun. Our people like it, and I think we are a pretty canny set. Archie said this from the other coach step, where he had perched, while the rest climbed up before and behind to join in the chat as they rested. I'm Fitz James, and he's Roderick Dhu, and we'll give you the broadsword combat some day. It's a great thing, you'd better believe, added the prince. Yes, and you should hear Steve play the pipes. He makes him skirl like a good one, cried Will from the box, eager to air the accomplishments of his race. Max, the fellow to hunt up the old stories and tell us how to dress right, and pick out rousing bits for us to speak and sing, put in Geordie, saying a good word for the absent worm. "'And what do you and Will do?' asked Rose of Jamie, who sat beside her, as if bound to keep her in sight till the promised gift had been handed over. "'Oh, I'm the little footpage, and do errands, and Will and Geordie are the troops when we march, and the stags when we hunt, and the traitors when we want to cut any heads off.' "'They are very obliging, I'm sure,' said Rose, whereat the utility men beamed with modest pride, and resolved to enact Wallace and Montrose as soon as possible for their cousin's special benefit. "'Let's have a game of tag!' cried the prince, swinging himself up to a beam with a sounding slap on Stevie's shoulder. Regardless of his gloves, Dandy tore after him, and the rest swarmed in every direction, as if bent on breaking their necks and dislocating their joints as rapidly as possible. It was a new and astonishing spectacle to Rose, fresh from a prim boarding school, and she watched the active lads with breathless interest thinking their antics far superior to those of Mops, the dear departed monkey. Will had just covered himself with glory by pitching off a high loft head first and coming up all right, when Phoebe appeared with the cloak, hood and rubbers, and also a message from Aunt Plenty that Miss Rose was to come in directly. All right, we'll bring her, answered Archie, issuing some mysterious order, which was so promptly obeyed that, before Rose could get out of the carriage, the boys had caught hold of the pole and rattled her out of the barn, round the oval, and up to the front door with a cheer that brought two caps to an upper window and caused Debbie to cry aloud from the back porch. "'Em harem scarum boys will certainly be the death of that delicate little creature." But the delicate little creature seemed all the better for her trip, and ran up the steps looking rosy, gay and dishevelled, to be received with lamentation by Aunt Plenty, who begged her to go and lie down at once. "'Oh, please don't! We have come to tea with our cousin, and will be as good as gold if you'll let us stay, auntie,' clamoured the boys, who not only approved of our cousin, but had no mind to lose their tea, for Aunt Plenty's name but feebly expressed her bountiful nature. "'Well, dears, you can. Only be quiet, and let Rose go and take her iron, and be made tidy, and then we will see what we can find for supper,' said the old lady as she trotted away followed by a volley of directions for the approaching feast. Marmalade for me, auntie. Plenty of plum cake, please. Tell Debbie to trot out the baked pears. I'm your man for lemon pie, ma'am. Do you have fritters? Rose will like them. She'd rather have tarts, I know. When Rose came down fifteen minutes later, with every curl smoothed and her most beruffled apron on, she found the boys loafing about the long hall and paused on the halfway landing to take an observation for till now she had not really examined her new-found cousins. There was a strong family resemblance among them, 
though some of the yellow heads were darker than others, some of the cheeks brown instead of rosy, and the ages varied all the way from sixteen-year-old Archie to Jamie, who was ten years younger. None of them were especially comely, but the prince, yet all were hearty, happy-looking lads, and Rose decided that boys were not as dreadful as she had expected to find them. They were all so characteristically employed that she could not help smiling as she looked. Archie and Charlie, evidently great cronies, were pacing up and down, shoulder to shoulder, whistling Bonnie Dundee. Mac was reading in a corner, with his book close to his near-sighted eyes. Dandy was arranging his hair before the oval glass in the hat-stand, Geordie and Will investigating the internal economy of the moon-faced clock, and Jamie lay kicking up his heels on the mat at the foot of the stairs, bent on demanding his sweeties the instant Rose appeared. She guessed his intention, and forestalled his demand by dropping a handful of sugar-plums down upon him. At his cry of rapture, the other lads looked up and smiled involuntarily. The little kinswoman standing there above was a winsome sight, with her shy, soft eyes, bright hair, and laughing face. The black frock reminded them of her loss, and filled the boyish hearts with a kindly desire to be good to our cousin, who had no longer any home but this. "'There she is, as fine as you please,' cried Steve, kissing his hand to her. "'Come on, Missy, tea is ready,' added the prince encouragingly. "'I shall take her in,' and Archie offered his arm with great dignity, an honour that made Rose turn as red as a cherry and long to run upstairs again. It was a merry supper, and the two elder boys added much to the fun by tormenting the rest with dark hints of some interesting event which was about to occur. Something uncommonly fine, they declared it was, but enveloped in the deepest mystery for the present. "'Did I ever see it?' asked Jamie. "'Not to remember it, but Mac and Steve have, and liked it immensely,' answered Archie, thereby causing the two mentioned to neglect Debbie's delectable fritters for several minutes while they cudgelled their brains. "'Who will have it first? asked Will, with his mouth full of marmalade. "'Aunt Plenty, I guess.' "'When will she have it?' demanded Georgie, bouncing in his seat with impatience. "'Sometime on Monday.' "'Heart alive! What is the boy talking about?' cried the old lady from behind the tall urn, which left little to be seen but the topmost bow of her cap. "'Doesn't Andy know?' asked a chorus of voices. "'No, and that's the best of the joke, for she is desperately fond of it.' "'What colour is it?' asked Rose, joining in the fun. "'Blue and brown.' "'Is it good to eat?' asked Jamie. "'Some people think so, but I shouldn't like to try it,' answered Charlie, laughing so he spilt his tea. "'Who does it belong to?' put in Steve. Archie and the prince stared at one another rather blankly for a minute. Then Archie answered with a twinkle of the eye that made Charlie explode again. "'To Grandfather Campbell!' This was a poser, and they gave up the puzzle though Jamie confided to Rose that he did not think he could live till Monday without knowing what this remarkable thing was. Soon after tea, the clan departed, singing All the Blue Bonnets Are Over the Border at the tops of their voices. "'Well, dear, how do you like your cousins?' asked Aunt Plenty, as the last pony frisked round the corner and the din died away. "'Pretty well, ma'am, but I like Phoebe better.' an answer which caused Aunt Plenty to hold up her hands in despair, and trot away to tell Sister Peace that she never should understand that child, and it was a mercy Alec was coming soon to take the responsibility off their hands. Fatigued by the unusual exertions of the afternoon, Rose curled herself up in the sofa corner to rest and think about the great mystery, little guessing that she was to know it first of all. Right in the middle of her meditations, she fell asleep and dreamed she was at home again in her own little bed. She seemed to wake and see her father bending over her, to hear him say, My little Rose, to answer, Yes, Papa, and then to feel him take her in his arms and kiss her tenderly. So sweet, so real was the dream, that she started up with a cry of joy to find herself in the arms of a brown, bearded man, who held her close and whispered in a voice so like her father's, that she clung to him involuntarily. This is my little girl, and I am Uncle Alec. End of chapter 2
Three, uncles. When Rose woke next morning, she was not sure whether she had dreamed what occurred the night before, or it had actually happened. So she hopped up and dressed, although it was an hour earlier than she usually rose, for she could not sleep any more, being possessed with a strong desire to slip down and see if the big portmanteau and packing cases were really in the hall. She seemed to remember tumbling over them when she went to bed, for the aunts had sent her off very punctually, because they wanted their pet nephew all to themselves. The sun was shining, and Rose opened her window to let in the soft May air fresh from the sea. As she leaned over her little balcony, watching an early bird get the worm, and wondering how she should like Uncle Alec, she saw a man leap the garden wall and come whistling up the path. At first she thought it was some trespasser, but a second look showed her that it was her uncle, returning from an early dip into the sea. She had hardly dared to look at him the night before, because whenever she tried to do so she always found a pair of keen blue eyes looking at her. Now she could take a good stare at him as he lingered along, looking about him as if glad to see the old place again. A brown, breezy man, in a blue jacket, with no hat on the curly head, which he shook now and then like a water-dog, broad-shouldered, alert in his motions, and with a general air of strength and stability about him which pleased Rose, though she could not explain the feeling of comfort it gave her. She had just said to herself, with a sense of relief, "'I guess I shall like him, though he looks as if he made people mind,' when he lifted his eyes to examine the budding horse-chestnut overhead, and saw the eager face peering down at him. He waved his hand to her, nodded, and called out in a bluff, cheery voice, "'You are on deck early, little niece.' "'I got up to see if you had really come, uncle.' "'Did you? Well, come down here and make sure of it.' "'I'm not allowed to go out before breakfast, sir.' "'Oh, indeed,' with a shrug. "'Then I'll come aboard and salute,' he added. And, to Rose's great amazement, Uncle Alec went up one of the pillars of the back piazza, hand over hand, stepped across the roof, and swung himself into her balcony, saying, as he landed on the wide balustrade, "'Have you any doubts about me now, ma'am?' Rose was so taken aback, she could only answer with a smile as she went to meet him. "'How does my girl do this morning?' he asked, taking the little cold hand she gave him in both his big warm ones. "'Pretty well, thank you, sir.' "'Ah, but it should be very well. Why isn't it?' "'I always wake up with a headache and feel tired.' "'Don't you sleep well?' "'I lie awake a long time, and then I dream, and my sleep does not seem to rest me much. "'What do you do all day?' "'Oh, I read, and sew a little, and take naps and sit with Auntie.' "'No running about out of doors, or housework, or riding, eh?' Aunt Plenty says I'm not strong enough for much exercise. I drive out with her sometimes, but I don't care for it. I'm not surprised at that, said Uncle Alec, half to himself, adding in his quick way, Who have you had to play with? No one but Amabel Bliss, and she was such a goose I couldn't bear her. The boys came yesterday and seemed rather nice, but of course I couldn't play with them. Why not? I'm too old to play with boys. Not a bit of it. That's just what you need, for you've been mollycoddled too much. They're good lads, and you'll be mixed up with them, more or less, for years to come, so you may as well be friends and playmates at once. I will look you up some girls also, if I can find a sensible one, who is not spoilt by her nonsensical education. Phoebe is sensible, I'm sure, and I like her, though I only saw her yesterday, cried Rose, waking up suddenly. And who is Phoebe, if you please? Rose eagerly told all she knew, and Uncle Alec listened, with an odd smile lurking about his mouth, though his eyes were quite sober as he watched the face before him. "'I'm glad to see that you are not aristocratic in your tastes, but I don't quite make out why you like this young lady from the poor house. "'You may laugh at me, but I do. I can't tell why, only she seems so happy and busy and sings so beautifully.' and is strong enough to scrub and sweep, and hasn't any troubles to plague her, said Rose, making a funny jumble of reasons in her efforts to explain. How do you know that? Oh, I was telling her about mine, and asked if she had any, and she said, No, only I'd like to go to school, and I mean to some day. So she doesn't call desertion, poverty, and hard work troubles? 
She's a brave little girl, and I shall be proud to know her. And Uncle Alec gave an approving nod that made Rose wish she had been the one to earn it. But what are these troubles of yours, child? he asked, after a minute of silence. Please don't ask me, Uncle. Can't you tell them to me as well as to Phoebe? Something in his tone made Rose feel that it would be better to speak out and be done with it, so she answered, with sudden color and averted eyes. The greatest one was losing dear Papa. As she said that, Uncle Alec's arm came gently round her, and he drew her to him, saying in the voice so like Papa's, That is a trouble which I cannot cure, my child, but I shall try to make you feel it less. What else, dear? I'm so tired and, and poorly all the time, and I can't do anything I want to, and it makes me cross, sighed Rose, rubbing the aching head like a fretful child. That we can cure, and we will, said her uncle, with a decided nod that made the curls bob on his head, so that Rose saw the grey ones underneath the brown. Aunt Myra says, I have no constitution, and never shall be strong, observed Rose, in a pensive tone as if it was rather a nice thing to be an invalid. Aunt Myra is a <clears throat> an excellent woman, but it is her hobby to believe that everyone is tottering on the brink of the grave, and upon my life I believe she is offended if people don't fall into it. We will show her how to make constitutions and turn pale-faced little ghosts into rosy, hearty girls. That is my business, you know, he added more quietly, for his sudden outburst had rather startled Rose. I had forgotten you were a doctor. I'm glad of it, for I do want to be well, only I hope you won't give me much medicine, for I've taken quarts already and it does me no good. As she spoke, Rose pointed to a little table just inside the window, on which appeared a regiment of bottles. Aha! Now we'll see what mischief these blessed women have been at. And, making a long arm, Dr. Alex set the bottles on the wide railing before him, examined each carefully, smiled over some, frowned over others, and said, as he put down the last, "'Now, I'll show you the best way to take these messes.' And, quick as a flash, he sent one after another smashing down into the posy beds below. "'But Aunt Plenty won't like it, and Aunt Myra will be angry, for she sent most of them,' cried Rose, half frightened and half pleased at such energetic measures. "'You are my patient now, and I'll take the responsibility.' "'My way of giving physic is evidently the best, for you look better already,' he said, laughing so infectiously that Rose followed suit, saying saucily, "'If I don't like your medicines any better than those, I shall throw them into the garden, and then what will you do?' "'When I prescribe such rubbish, I'll give you leave to pitch it overboard as soon as you like. Now, what is the next trouble?' "'I hoped you would forget to ask. "'But how can I help you if I don't know them? "'Come.' Let us have number three. It is very wrong, I suppose, but I do sometimes wish I had not quite so many aunts. They are all very good to me, and I want to please them, but they are so different. I feel sort of pulled to pieces among them, said Rose, trying to express the emotions of a stray chicken with six hens all clucking over it at once. Uncle Alec threw back his head and laughed like a boy for he could entirely understand how the good ladies had each put in her oar and tried to paddle her own way, to the great disturbance of the waters and the entire bewilderment of poor Rose. "'I intend to try a course of uncles now, and see how that suits your constitution. I'm going to have you all to myself, and no one is to give a word of advice unless I ask it. There is no other way to keep order on board, and I am captain of this little craft, for a time at least. What comes next?' But Rose stuck there, and grew so red her uncle guessed what the trouble was. I, I don't think I can tell this one. It wouldn't be polite, and I feel pretty sure that it isn't going to be a trouble any more. As she blushed and stammered over these words, Dr. Alec turned his eyes away to the distant sea, and said so seriously, so tenderly, that she felt every word and long remembered them. My child, I don't expect you to love and trust me all at once, but I do want you to believe that I shall give my whole heart to this new duty, and if I make mistakes as I probably shall, no one will grieve over them more bitterly than I. 
It is my fault that I am a stranger to you, when I want to be your best friend. That is one of my mistakes, and I never repented it more deeply than I do now. Your father and I had a trouble once, and I thought I could never forgive him, so I kept away for years. Thank God we made it all up the last time I saw him, and he told me then that if he was forced to leave her, he should bequeath his little girl to me as a token of his love. I can't fill his place, but I shall try to be a father to her, and if she learns to love me half as well as she did the good one she has lost, I shall be a proud and happy man. Will she believe this and try? Something in Uncle Ack's face touched Rose to the heart, and when he held out his hand with that anxious, troubled look in his eyes, she was moved to put up her innocent lips and seal the contract with a confiding kiss. The strong arm held her close a minute, and she felt the broad chest heave once, as if with a great sigh of relief. But not a word was spoken, till a tap at the door made both start. Rose popped her head through the window to say, "'Come in!' while Dr. Alec hastily rubbed the sleeve of his jacket across his eyes and began to whistle again. Phoebe appeared with a cup of coffee. "'Debbie told me to bring this and help you get up,' she said, opening her black eyes wide, as if she wondered how on earth the sailor man got there. "'I'm all dressed, so I don't need any help. I hope that is good and strong,' added Rose, eyeing the steaming cup with an eager look. But she did not get it. Her brown hand took possession of it, as her uncle said quickly. "'Hold hard, my lass, and let me overhaul that dose before you take it. "'Do you drink all this strong coffee every morning, Rose?' "'Yes, sir, and I like it. Auntie says it turns me up, and I always feel better after it.' "'This accounts for the sleepless nights, the flutter your heart gets into at the least start, "'and this is why that cheek of yours is pale yellow instead of rosy red. "'No more coffee for you, my dear.' "'and by and by you'll see that I am right. "'Any new milk downstairs, Phoebe?' "'Yes, sir. Plenty. Right in from the barn. "'That's the drink for my patient. "'Go. Bring me a pitcherful. And another cup. "'I want a draught myself. "'This won't hurt the honeysuckles, for they have no nerves to speak of.' "'And, to Rose's great discomfort, the coffee went after the medicine.' Dr. Alex saw the injured look she put on, but took no notice, and presently banished it by saying pleasantly, "'I've got a capital little cup among my traps, and I'll give it to you to drink your milk in, as it is made of wood that is supposed to improve whatever is put into it, something like a quassia cup. That reminds me. One of the boxes Phoebe wanted to lug upstairs last night is for you. Knowing that I was coming home to find a ready-made daughter, I picked up all sorts of odd and pretty trifles along the way.' "'hoping she would be able to find something she liked among them all. "'Early tomorrow we'll have a grand rummage. "'Here is our milk. "'I propose the health of Miss Rose Campbell, "'and drink it with all my heart.' "'It was impossible for Rose to pout "'with the prospect of a delightful box full of gifts "'dancing before her eyes. "'So, in spite of herself, she smiled as she drank her own health "'and found that fresh milk was not a hard dose to take.' "'Now I must be off, before I am caught again with my wig in a toss,' said Dr. Alec, preparing to descend the way he came. "'Do you always go in and out like a cat, Uncle?' asked Rose, much amused at his odd ways. "'I used to sneak out of my window when I was a boy, so I need not disturb the aunts. And now I rather like it, for it's the shortest road, and keeps me limber when I have no rigging to climb. "'Good-bye till breakfast.' And away he went, down the water-spout, over the roof, and vanished among the budding honeysuckles below. "'Ain't he a funny guardian?' exclaimed Phoebe, as she went off with the cups. "'He is a very kind one, I think,' answered Rose, following, to prowl round the big boxes and try to guess which was hers. When her uncle appeared at the sound of the bell, he found her surveying with an anxious face a new dish that smoked upon the table. "'Got a fresh trouble, Rosie?' he asked. "'stroking her smooth head. "'Uncle, are you going to make me eat oatmeal?' "'asked Rose in a tragic tone. "'Don't you like it?' "'I detest it,' answered Rose, "'with all the emphasis which a turned-up nose, "'a shudder, and a groan could give to the three words. "'You are not a true Scotchwoman "'if you don't like the parritch,' 
It's a pity, for I made it myself, and thought we'd have such a good time with all that cream to float it in. Well, never mind. And he sat down with a disappointed air. Rose had made up her mind to be obstinate about it, because she did heartily detest the dish. But as Uncle Alec did not attempt to make her obey, she suddenly changed her mind and thought she would. I'll try to eat it, to please you, Uncle. But people are always saying how wholesome it is, and that makes me hate it, she said, half ashamed at her silly excuse. I do want you to like it, because I wish my girl to be as well and strong as Jessie's boys, who were brought up on this in the good old fashion. No hot bread and fried stuff for them, and they are the biggest and bonniest lads of the lot. Bless you, Auntie, and good morning. Dr. Alec turned to greet the old lady, and, with a firm resolve to eat or die in the attempt, Rose sat down. In five minutes she forgot what she was eating, so interested was she in the chat that went on. It amused her very much to hear Aunt Plenty call her forty-year-old nephew, My dear boy, and Uncle Alec was so full of lively gossip about all creation in general, and the Aunt Hill in particular, that the detested porridge vanished without a murmur. "'You will go to church with us, I hope, Alec, if you are not too tired,' said the old lady when breakfast was over. "'I came all the way from Calcutta for that express purpose, ma'am. Only I must send the sisters word of my arrival, for they don't expect me till tomorrow, you know, and there will be a row in church if those boys see me without warning.' "'I'll send Ben up the hill, and you can step over to Myra's yourself. "'It will please her, and you will have plenty of time.' "'Dr. Alec was off at once, and they saw no more of him "'till the old barouche was at the door, "'and Aunt Plenty just rustling downstairs in her Sunday best, "'with Rose like a little black shadow behind her. "'Away they drove in state, and all the way Uncle Alec's hat "'was more off his head than on, "'for every one they met smiled and bowed "'and gave him as blithe a greeting as the day permitted.' It was evident that the warning had been a wise one, for, in spite of time and place, the lads were in such a ferment that their elders sat in momentary dread of an unseemly outbreak somewhere. It was simply impossible to keep those fourteen eyes off Uncle Alec, and the dreadful things that were done during sermon time will hardly be believed. Rose dared not look up after a while, for these bad boys vented their emotions upon her till she was ready to laugh and cry with mingled amusement and vexation. Charlie winked rapturously at her behind his mother's fan. Mac openly pointed to the tall figure beside her. Jamie stared fixedly over the back of his pew, till Rose thought his round eyes would drop out of his head. George fell over a stool and dropped three books in his excitement. Will drew sailors and Chinamen on his clean cuffs, and displayed them to Rose's great tribulation. Steve nearly upset the whole party by burning his nose with salts, as he pretended to be overcome by his joy. Even dignified Archie disgraced himself by writing in his hymn book, Isn't he blue and brown? and passing it politely to Rose. Her only salvation was trying to fix her attention upon Uncle Mac, a portly, placid gentleman who seemed entirely unconscious of the iniquities of the clan and dozed peacefully in his pew corner. This was the only uncle Rose had met for years, for Uncle Jem and Uncle Steve the husbands of Aunt Jessie and Aunt Clara, were at sea, and Aunt Myra was a widow. Uncle Mac was a merchant, very rich and busy, and as quiet as a mouse at home, for he was in such a minority among the women folk he dared not open his lips, and let his wife rule undisturbed. Rose liked the big, kindly, silent man who came to her when Papa died, and was always sending her splendid boxes of goodies at school, and often invited her into his great warehouse— full of teas and spices, wines and all sorts of foreign fruits, there to eat and carry away whatever she liked. She had secretly regretted that he was not to be her guardian, but since she had seen Uncle Alec she felt better about it, for she did not particularly admire Aunt Jane. When church was over, Dr. Alec got into the porch as quickly as possible, and there the young bears had a hug all round, while the sisters shook hands and welcomed him with bright faces and glad hearts. Rose was nearly crushed flat behind a door in that dangerous passage from pew to porch, but Uncle Mac rescued her and put her into the carriage for safe keeping. "'Now, girls, I want you all to come and dine with Alec. Mac also, of course. But I cannot ask the boys, 
for we did not expect this dear fellow till to-morrow, you know, so I made no preparations. Send the lads home and let them wait till Monday, for really I was shocked at their behaviour in church, said Aunt Plenty, as she followed Rose. In any other place the defrauded boys would have set up a howl. As it was, they growled and protested, till Dr. Alex settled the matter by saying, "'Never mind, old chaps. I'll make it up to you tomorrow, if you shear off quietly. If you don't, not a blessed thing shall you have out of my big boxes.'" End of chapter 3 Aunts All dinner time, Rose felt that she was going to be talked about, and afterwards she was sure of it, for Aunt Plenty whispered to her as they went into the parlour, "'Run up and sit a while with Sister Peace, my dear. She likes to have you read while she rests, and we are going to be busy.' Rose obeyed, and the quiet rooms above were so like a church that she soon composed her ruffled feelings, and was unconsciously a little minister of happiness to the sweet old lady, who for years had sat there patiently, waiting to be set free from pain. Rose knew the sad romance of her life, and it gave a certain tender charm to this great-aunt of hers, whom she already loved. When peace was twenty, she was about to be married, all was done, the wedding dress lay ready, the flowers were waiting to be put on, the happy hour at hand, when word came that the lover was dead. They thought the gentle peace would die too, but she bore it bravely, put away her bridal gear took up her life afresh and lived on, a beautiful, meek woman with hair as white as snow and cheeks that never bloomed again. She wore no black, but soft, pale colours, as if always ready for the marriage that had never come. For thirty years she had lived on, fading slowly but cheerfully, busy and full of interest in all that went on in the family, especially the joys and sorrows of the young girls growing up about her and to them she was adviser, confidant, and friend in all their tender trials and delights. A truly beautiful old maiden, with her silvery hair, tranquil face, and an atmosphere of repose about her that soothed whoever came to her. Aunt Plenty was utterly dissimilar, being a stout, brisk old lady with a sharp eye, a lively tongue, and a face like a winter apple. Always trotting, chatting, and bustling, she was a regular Martha, cumbered with the cares of this world and quite happy in them. Rose was right, and while she softly read psalms to Aunt Peace, the other ladies were talking about her little self in the frankest manner. "'Well, Alec, how do you like your ward?' began Aunt Jane, as they all settled down, and Uncle Mac deposited himself in a corner to finish his doze. "'I should like her better if I could have begun at the beginning, and so got a fair start.' Poor George led such a solitary life that the child has suffered in many ways, and, since he died, she has been going on worse than ever, judging from the state I find her in. "'My dear boy, we did what we thought best, while waiting for you to wind up your affairs and get home. I always hoped, George, he was wrong to bring her up as he did, but he never took my advice, and now here we are with this poor dear child upon our hands.' "'I, for one, freely confess that I don't know what to do with her "'any more than if she was one of those strange, outlandish birds "'you used to bring home from foreign parts.' "'And Aunt Plenty gave a perplexed shake of the head, "'which caused great commotion among the stiff loops of purple ribbon "'that bristled all over her cap like crocus buds. "'If my advice had been taken, "'she would have remained at the excellent school where I placed her. "'But our aunt thought best to remove her because she complained, and she has been dawdling about ever since she came. A most ruinous state of things for a morbid, spoilt girl like Rose, said Mrs. Jane severely. She had never forgiven the old ladies for yielding to Rose's pathetic petition that she might wait her guardian's arrival before beginning another term at the school, which was a regular blimber hotbed and turned out many a feminine toots. I never thought it the proper school for a child in good circumstances, an heiress, in fact, as Rose is. It is all very well for girls who are to get their own living by teaching and that sort of thing, but all she needs is a year or two at a fashionable finishing school, so that at eighteen she can come out with a Clare, put in Aunt Clara. 
who had been a beauty and a belle, and was still a handsome woman. "'Dear, dear, how short-sighted you all are, to be discussing education and plans for the future, when this unhappy child is so plainly marked for the tomb,' sighed Aunt Myra, with a lugubrious sniff and a solemn wag of the funeral bonnet, which she refused to remove, being afflicted with a chronic catarrh. "'Now, it is my opinion that the dear thing only wants freedom, rest, and care. There is a look in her eyes that goes to my heart, for it shows that she feels the need of what none of us can give her. A mother, said Aunt Jessie, with tears in her own bright eyes at the thought of her boys being left, as Rose was, to the care of others. Uncle Alec, who had listened silently as each spoke, turned quickly toward the last sister and said, with a decided nod of approval, You've got it, Jessie, and with you to help me. I hope to make the child feel that she is not quite fatherless and motherless. I'll do my best, Alec, and I think you will need me, for, wise as you are, you cannot understand a tender, timid little creature like Rose, as a woman can, said Mrs. Jessie, smiling back at him with a heart full of motherly goodwill. I cannot help feeling that I, who have had a daughter of my own, can best bring up a girl— and I'm very much surprised that George did not entrust her to me, observed Aunt Myra, with an air of melancholy importance, for she was the only one who had given a daughter to the family, and she felt that she had distinguished herself, though ill-natured people said that she had dosed her darling to death. I never blamed him in the least when I remember the perilous experiments you tried with poor Carrie, began Mrs. Jane in her hard voice. "'Jane Campbell, I will not hear a word. "'My sainted Caroline is a sacred subject,' cried Aunt Myra, "'rising as if to leave the room. "'Dr. Alec detained her, "'feeling that he must define his position at once "'and maintain it manfully "'if he hoped to have any success in his new undertaking. "'Now, my dear souls, "'don't let us quarrel and make Rose a bone of contention, "'though upon my word she is almost a bone, poor little lass.' You have had her among you for a year, and done what you liked. I cannot say that your success is great, but that is owing to too many fingers in the pie. Now, I intend to try my way for a year, and if at the end of it she is not in better trim than now, I'll give up the case and hand her over to someone else. That's fair, I think. She will not be here a year hence, poor darling, so no one need dread future responsibility, said Aunt Myra folding her black gloves as if all ready for the funeral. "'By Jupiter, Myra, you are enough to doubt the ardour of a saint,' cried Dr. Alec, with a sudden spark in his eyes. "'Your croaking will worry that child out of her wits, for she is an imaginative puss, and will fret and fancy untold horrors. You have put it into her head that she has no constitution, and she rather likes the idea. If she had not had a pretty good one—' She would have been marked for the tomb by this time, the rate you have been going on with her. I will not have any interference. Please understand that. So just wash your hands of her, and let me manage till I want help. Then I'll ask for it. Hear, hear, came from the corner, where Uncle Mac was apparently wrapped in slumber. You are appointed guardian, so we can do nothing. But I predict that the girl will be spoiled, utterly spoiled answered Mrs. Jane, grimly. "'Thank you, sister. I have an idea that if a woman can bring up two boys as perfectly as you do yours, a man, if he devotes his whole mind to it, may at least attempt as much with one girl,' replied Dr. Alec, with a humorous look that tickled the others immensely, for it was a well-known fact in the family that Jane's boys were more indulged than all the other lads put together. I am quite easy, for I really do think that Alec will improve the child's health, and by the time his year is out, it will be quite soon enough for her to go to Madame Roccabella's and be finished off, said Aunt Clara, settling her rings, and thinking, with languid satisfaction, of the time when she could bring out a pretty and accomplished niece. I suppose you will stay here in the old place, unless you think of marrying, and it's high time you did, put in Mrs. Jane much nettled by her brother's last hit. "'No, thank you. Come and have a cigar, Mac,' said Dr. Alec abruptly. "'Don't marry. Women enough in the family already,' 
muttered Uncle Mac, and then the gentleman hastily fled. Aunt Peace would like to see you all, she says, was the message Rose brought before the ladies could begin again. Hectic, hectic, dear me, dear me, murmured Aunt Myra, as the shadow of her gloomy bonnet fell upon Rose, and the stiff tips of her black glove touched the cheek, where the colour deepened under so many eyes. I am glad these pretty curls are natural. They will be invaluable by and by, said Aunt Clara, taking an observation with her head on one side. Now that your uncle has come, I no longer expect you to review the studies of the past year. I trust your time will not be entirely wasted in frivolous sports, however, added Aunt Jane, sailing out of the room with the air of a martyr. Aunt Jessie said not a word but kissed her little niece with a look of tender sympathy that made Rose cling to her a minute and follow her with grateful eyes as the door closed behind her. After everybody had gone home, Dr. Alec paced up and down the lower hall in the twilight for an hour, thinking so intently that sometimes he frowned, sometimes he smiled, and more than once he stood still in a brown study. All of a sudden, he said, half aloud, as if he had made up his mind, "'I might as well begin at once.' and give the child something new to think about, for Myra's dismals and Jane's lectures have made her as blue as a little indigo bag. Diving into one of the trunks that stood in a corner, he brought up, after a brisk rummage, a silken cushion, prettily embroidered, and a quaint cup of dark carved wood. "'This will do for a start,' he said, as he plumped up the cushion and dusted the cup. "'It won't do to begin too energetically, or Rose will be frightened. I must beguile her.' "'gently and pleasantly along, till I've won her confidence, "'and then she will be ready for anything.' "'Just then Phoebe came out of the dining-room "'with a plate of brown bread, "'for Rose had been allowed no hot biscuit for tea. "'I'll relieve you of some of that,' said Dr. Alec, "'and, helping himself to a generous slice, "'he retired to the study, "'leaving Phoebe to wonder at his appetite. "'She would have wondered still more "'if she had seen him making that brown bread "'into neat little pills.' which he packed into an attractive ivory box, out of which he emptied his own bits of lovage. "'There. If they insist on medicine, I'll order these, and no harm will be done. I will have my own way, but I'll keep the peace, if possible, and confess the joke when my experiment has succeeded,' he said to himself, looking very much like a mischievous boy, as he went off with his innocent prescriptions. Rose was playing softly on the small organ that stood in the upper hall, so that Aunt Peace could enjoy it, and all the while he talked with the old ladies, Uncle Alec was listening to the fitful music of the child, and thinking of another Rose, who used to play for him. As the clock struck eight, he called out, "'Time for my girl to be abed, else she won't be up early, and I'm full of jolly plans for tomorrow. Come and see what I have found for you to begin upon.' Rose ran in and listened with a bright, attentive face, while Dr. Alec said, impressively, in my wanderings over the face of the earth, I have picked up some excellent remedies, and, as they are rather agreeable ones, I think you and I will try them. This is an herb pillow, given to me by a wise old woman when I was ill in, in India. It is filled with saffron, poppies, and other soothing plants, so lay your little head on it tonight, sleep sweetly without a dream, and wake tomorrow without a pain. Shall I really? How nice it smells! and Rose willingly received the pretty pillow, and stood, enjoying its faint, sweet odour, as she listened to the doctor's next remedy. "'This is the cup I told you of. Its virtue depends, they say, on the drinker filling it himself. So you must learn to milk. I'll teach you.' "'I'm afraid I never can,' said Rose, but she surveyed the cup with favour, for a funny little imp danced on the handle, as if all ready to take a header into the white sea below. "'Don't you think she ought to have something more strengthening than milk, Alec? "'I really shall feel anxious if she does not have a tonic of some sort,' "'said Aunt Plenty, eyeing the new remedy suspiciously, "'for she had more faith in her old-fashioned doses "'than all the magic cups and poppy pillows of the East. "'Well, ma'am, I'm willing to give her a pill, if you think best. "'It is a very simple one, and very large quantities may be taken without harm.' "'You know hashish is the extract of hemp? "'Well, this is a preparation of corn and rye. 
much used in old times, and I hope it will be again. Dear me, how singular, said Aunt Plenty, bringing her spectacles to bear upon the pills, with a face so full of respectful interest that it was almost too much for Dr. Alec's gravity. Take one in the morning, and a good night to you, my dear, he said, dismissing his patient with a hearty kiss. Then, as she vanished, he put both hands into his hair, exclaiming, with a comical mixture of anxiety and amusement, "'When I think what I have undertaken, I declare to you, aunt, I feel like running away and not coming back till Rose is eighteen. End of chapter 4